All right. I think we're all set and ready for you, brother. Okay. Let's go to the first slide. As you see, the, the topic is glory to glory. And I was first dressed in the Book of Mormon, and I, in Romans we find, it says, if the law was glorious, how much glorious is the spirit of God? If that law was glorious that to humble us, that we had looked to Christ, whereby we may obtain that faith, and that faith brings us to another level because Christ is the righteousness of the law. Therefore, he teaches us how that the Father and I are one, and he tells us that you and I are one with the Father and the Son, that we go from glory to glory to understand the power and the things of God. That's why I said, therefore, leaving the principality of the doctrine of Christ, things blocking it, let me see, doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith, towards God. Thus we begin to find out, I have principal doctrine going unto perfection, the foundation of repentance and faith towards God. I'm going to bring you now into the Book of Mormon before we, and this is going to lay the foundation as we go forward with the lesson, because we begin first come in to the principle of the doctrine of Christ. And we're going to read about this doctrine of Christ, and then we'll move into the lesson what God is talking about. I'll be reading from the Book of Mormon, Third Nephi, uh, 11th chapter, and beginning on the 31st verse. Like I tell you, Jeremy, there's always stuff that's coming in. <laughs> 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 this came in this morning. <laughs> 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 so follow along with me, and I will need some help throughout this lesson to give you some reading, but this is what we have already obtained to. We have this. So when it said leave the principal goes on to perfection, that's where we're going to. We don't have to go into the foundation of repentance. We don't have to address faith towards Christ because we have that. So when we get into the Book of Mormon here, it explains the very thing that Romans 6 is talking about. It says, Behold, verily they I say unto you, I will declare unto you my doctrine. And this is my doctrine. It is the doctrine which the Father has given unto me, and I bear record of the Father, and the Father bear record of me. And the Holy Ghost bear record of the Father and me. And I bear record that the Father commanded all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. That was the power of the law that let us know that we had no righteousness among ourselves, but our righteousness was in Jesus Christ. So he had to teach us that we were a sinner that we may look up and live and address him the gospel. Like he tells us, no man comes unto me that's my father draws him. So when he says, the father not take my bow in you, that's the glory of God given to you and I, because we recognize that the father has given us. So here he is laying down a sure foundation that we stand upon, that we may go from glory to glory. And when we get into this glory, it changes our whole mindset. It changes our attitude. It gives us a better understanding of the power of God that's inside us and the glory of God that's revealed within us. It says, Whoso believeth in me and is baptized, the same shall be saved. And they are they who shall what? Inherit the kingdom of God. In my Father's house and many mansions, I go and prepare a place for you. Since he cannot lie, we know this is true. So we don't stagger at the promise. We know we fulfill the things of God. There's something waiting for us. There's a thing there. He says, and whoso believes not in me is not baptized, shall be damned. Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine, and I bear record of it from the Father. Whoso believeth in me, believeth in, believeth in the Father also, unto him will the Father bear record, bear record of me, and he will visit him with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And part of that thing in, in, up there in uh, Hebrew says is a laying on of hands. We have received these things, bearing record, and then we have the Holy Ghost. We have the spirit of the truth that tells you all things, the Father, Son, past, present, and future, all things that the spirit revealed to us in prophecy and revelation, the spirit of the truth brings forth an understanding 
that we may know all things. And there's a power even in the Holy Ghost that's given unto you and I. So God is completing us to show us the glory of God that's manifested in us. He said, thus will the Father bear record of me, and the Holy Ghost will bear record unto him of the Father and me. For the Father and I and the Holy Ghost are one. So this is what he has given unto us. That's why I keep reference back to you in John 17. He said, the same love that we have, I have given unto them. He said, the Father and I take our bow in you, we become one in Christ. So as we become one in Christ, we begin to see the glory of God that's written in the Book of Mormon to give us a sound understanding and perfection is being obedient to the word of God and God manifests his gift in you and I that we may be the sons and daughters of God in these latter days. And we may walk upright before God because we've been obedient unto his commandment. Therefore, our faith has made us whole, one in the things of God. I think I'm 37, I think I'm on. Yeah, okay. And again, I say unto you, you must repent and become as a little child and be baptized in my name, or, or ye can no wise receive these things. And again, I say unto you, you must repent and be baptized in my name and become as a little child, or else you can no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Very, very send to you that this is my doctrine. And whoso built upon this, built upon my rock, and the gates of hell should not prevail against them. Satan has no power over you and I unless we give it to him. Fear dictates that. Doubt dictates Staggering at the things of God. Know what we're standing on, what God has given us. There is no temptation you can't overcome, but God is with you. So he's showing you and I, if you look within, we see with without, that nothing can take us. Nothing can harm us. He said, who shall declare more or less than this and establish it for my doctrine, the same comes of evil and is not built upon my rock. For he that is built upon a standing foundation and the gates of hell shall open to receive such when the flood come and the winds beat upon it. Therefore go forth from this people and declare the word which I have spoken unto, unto the ends of the earth. So that was the assignment that was given. And the same mission is with us today from the ministry that brought you into the water's edge, that brought you into the glory of God. And let us move forward now and see how this thing is laid down to give us an understanding. Let's go to the next slide. Now, th this address is from King Benjamin. And I want you to see, for we, said, we talked about glory to glory. Now, watch how this is done. As you re as, Give me a reader. I want someone to read this and take the time and listen to what the words is telling you. Because words bring image to mind, right? Think about that. A word is an image. So here is the glory of God coming to us. We read in the doctrine of Christ what it says. Now watch these things form. It changes our mind. It changes our attitude. And it puts us in, the, in an understanding the power of God is inside you and I because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So give me a reader. Take your time and emphasize the, the underlying words. Just pause there a little bit. And see what's being said. And again, I say unto you, as I have said before, that as ye have come to the knowledge of the glory of God, or if ye have known of his goodness and have tasted of his love and have received a remission of your sins, which causeth such exceedingly great joy in your souls, even so, I would that ye should remember and always retain in remembrance the greatness of God and your own nothingness and his goodness and long suffering towards you, unworthy creatures, and humble yourselves even in the depths of humility, calling on the name of the Lord daily and standing steadfastly in the faith of that which is to come which was spoken by the mouth of the angel. Hold right there, Jeremy. Hold, 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 hold right there, one second. Now, their faith was in the who was to come. So Christ had not yet come, but their faith claimed the prophets that prophesied, faith what the angel said from the foundation of the world that Christ would come. Thus having that type of faith, they had the power of God with them. 
We have that now. We have that now. So as Jeremy goes into the next part, watch what he begins to do. Once you understand that. Go to the next verse, brother. And behold, I say unto you that if ye do this, ye shall always rejoice and be filled with the love of God and always retain a remission of your sins. And ye shall grow in the knowledge of the glory of him that created you or in the knowledge of that which is just and true. And you will not have a mind to injure one another, but to live peaceably and to render to every man according to that which is his due. Slide up. Remember we did 16, 17? Yeah, okay. Keep going. <clears throat> and also ye yourselves will succor those that stand in need of your succor, Ye will administer of your substance unto him that standeth in need, and ye will not suffer that the beggar putteth up his petition to you in vain, and turn him out to perish. And now, if God, who has created you, on whom you are dependent for your lives, and for all that you have and are, doth grant unto you whatsoever ye ask that is right in faith, believing that ye shall receive, O oh, then, how ye ought to impart of the substance that ye have one to another. And see that all these things are done in wisdom and order, for it is not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength. And again, it is expedient that he should be diligent, that thereby he might win the prize. Therefore, all things must be done in order. Therefore, God has given us the order as he brings us into things of understanding of glory to glory. And thus it says, even the last uh, 12 verse, that you have no desire to do harm one another, but you have a desire for love because you're in a peace and understanding that God has given us. Even as the day we, we, we talked about the, the natural things, I'm talking about, we're talking about water, we're talking about oil, we're talking about fuel, we're talking about bills, but we know that God has provided a means for us whereby these things may not overcome us. He has set things in manner, even as in the word is given to us, the how we help one another and, and how we give of the substance. And where this begin to go to, it shows you how to give. It talks into that, we get into the Hebrews in the end of the Corinthians, as Jeremy goes there. It talks about in Corinthians how that spiritually God provides for us the things we stand in need of. And he places one another in our life, not just the same for the friend that you may impart what God has given to you, that you also may draw them in because the love of God that's inside you that brought you to them, that they may see what the gospel is talking about. So each and every day, we are handling the word of God and we are growing spiritually because we're seeing what God is saying and we've taken King Benjamin's address to heart because we see the goodness in God. We see how our faith to claim these things that God has done. We are witness to it. And our testimony bear witness to because they bring forth the power and the glory of God that's in our life. Okay, let's go on to the next one, uh, Jeremy. Now, watch this here. Now, I, when I read this here, I thought about us. I thought about the church of Jesus Christ in this dispensation of time throughout the land. And I talked about the, the power of God and the great glory he has given us. And we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's our righteousness. That's the power of God. So here was Nephi speaking. And he said, it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed, listen to that, they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God and great glory. Power of God or the power of the Father. Father and the Son, take a bow bow in you. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, in this glory, we are armed with righteousness, we are armed with the power of God, and we are armed with the power of prayer. So stagger not at what God says to do. Stand up. And Lord, send me. Be able to be about your father's business and do that which is necessary that God would have you to do. Doing so, 
We bless one another with our service, and we bless those around us because we walk with righteousness and we walk with the power of God that's given unto us. Let's go on to the next one. How to give from the substance of God. Now, I'm going to read this very short here. It, it tells you what if, if you give a little, what you get a little. If you give a lot, you get a lot. And this keep tying in as you read this one, going to the next one. Then you're going to see the power of righteousness and the power of God as we give, as we provide. You know, just when you you taking care of someone else's need, you got your own need. Don't you know God's already taking care of your need because you did for someone else? You ain't going to want to take care of yourself first before you go out. Ain't nothing wrong to take care of home. But if you go out and give, right, God will provide. Does not take care of the sparrow? So you know he can take care of us. So don't say, I can't do it, I do this first. Lord, show me the way. And God knows what you have to do. He'll be there before you to get there. Someone begin to read this for me. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So you shouldn't say, well, I shouldn't do this. You already messed up. You should just give as your heart moves upon the situation that God may give. Why is that necessary? Go to the next verse. Next, uh, next slide. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Now listen to this. Therefore, as you are that giver of the things of God, you don't do it grudgingly, there's this grace and power of God is given to you and I that God provides. And this talks about if you, just like he said, I, I talked to Jeremy about this, just as he took to Moses, he wrote the stone, wrote the law with his finger of God. And in this particular verse it gets into, if the word of God is in you, and you've taken up that abode that Christ has done, then his words are written upon your heart. He says, the Father and I tabernacle your heart. I've given you the Holy Ghost and Spirit of Truth. And all our actions come not from our mind. Our actions come from our heart. So if the word of God is in your heart and mind, then the glory of God is manifesting to you. The spirit of God, the revelation of God, all these things are in you that you may even prophesy according as the spirit moves you. That you may be about your father's business. So these scriptures are telling us as we grow in the things of God, we must grow spiritually. And God has shown us, as written in the word, these things are taking place right now with you and I. Doing so, we see that what God is doing and continue to do as we grow in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's go on to the next one. Just give me a reader. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. And that glory is speaking about is the spirit of God. That glory is talking about is you and I. It's the covenant that God made with us that the waters as we made with him, that he is, that his righteousness is seed in, that, in glory, that we may understand the spirit and the life that Christ has given us. This is why in the New Testament, the ministry speaks by the spirit of God and not by the letter. It's not about don't do this and don't do that. The law is inside you, but we speak of Christ in you. What? The hope of glory as given to you and I, because Christ has said, the Father, I take our bow and you become one in God. So we're speaking and teaching of the spirit of God as for you and I to go forward, that we may serve God in spirit and in truth, that the power of God may come. 
He said, man, have I made my image and likeness. He said, man, I put my spirit in man. So the spirit of the inner man is the spirit of Christ that's in us that ties back in as we begin to close out this lesson. That was God is doing. Let us go on to the next one. Give me a reader. And it speaks for itself. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we are all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. As we open up from glory to glory, but all with open face and behold, as in the glass of, of glory of the Lord, we are what? Changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as the spirit of, of the Lord. That's that spirit that moves in you and I. He said, you and I, he said, you should do greater works than I have done because I go unto the Father. Therefore, as he moved forth into the glory of God and that same spirit which you and I have, that now we can work the works of God. Now we know that the Father and the Son has, 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 is, is with us and we're working forward to what God would have us to do. That we may sit down and what meditate upon the words of God, seeing what God has done in our life and not be dismayed because things can go this way. That's just one day. But look at it and learn from it. You know how you learn from something? You know, when I, when, I was, when I was a fireman, I had to learn from my mistakes on the fire ground. You only get one shot. You have to learn from your mistakes that you don't create them again. But as you go through this process, you begin to see and understand. Not nothing in your job you do. So, so is the spirit of God. We must learn not to doubt God. All things are possible with him. Not stagger because God said something. But let our faith be whole. Just like he even said, just believe. He ain't talking about the mustard seed. He said, just believe. If we do that much, God is able to move all contention, all doubt and fear from us that we may stand upright before him and be changed into the same image from glory to glory each and every day because of the spirit of God that's dwelling in us. So I wanted to make it short, brothers and sisters. I want to prolong it, but I want to get the point out that the power and the glory of God is given to you and I. And when we exercise these things, known for assure you that God is able. Let us stand fast and pray into a satisfied mind that the power of God may be revealed and the glory of God may be witnessed by you and I. That you may truly see him as he is because he's always with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. That's the power and the promise of God. May God bless you this day. Brother Walt, turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you for the focus. You know, we got to keep looking. We got to keep watching. And I think what you presented this morning helps us uh, uh, do that. So thank you for that. Um, got a song for the second thing.
know, <clears throat> for some reason this week, I got to thinking about a cruise that we took many years ago. And <clears throat> some of these cruise ships now, this one that we were on, I can't remember the name of it necessarily, um, are so big now <clears throat> that when they pull into these ports, they can't dock. <laughs> they gotta, they gotta stay out in the ocean, and the the big ship drops this anchor, and and uh, you you hear this chain rattling, and you hear this thud and splash, and the boat you know is there, and you have to get off on little tenders to uh, get to the port from that thing, and that's a scary thing sometimes in itself. But <clears throat> thinking about that anchor that gets dropped, and uh, you see this ship. Uh, stabilized and to a point. I mean, it doesn't drift anywhere. It, it kind of spins in a circle, you know, but it stays placed until they're ready to pull that thing up and sail away again. And uh, I think about the anchor that holds our souls in our life. We've got an anchor. Hymn number 66 in the same symbol. We have an anchor. A couple verses here, it says, uh, First verse says, will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when strong tides lift and the cable strain, will your anchor <laughs> drift or firm remain? Kind of like that ship, you know? And this song's about us and, and, our, and our faith and, and, our, and our hope and our belief in what just Brother Clifton kind of taught us about our, our faith in the Lord, you know, the power that's there, the glory that's there in the Lord as we believe. Third verse goes on and says, it will firmly hold in the straits of fear when the breakers have told the, the reef is near. Through the, though the tempest rage and the wild winds blow, not an angry wave shall our bark old flow talks about the struggles of life, the things that come our way, that because we're anchored in Christ, we're going to hold firm. The chorus says, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure as the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. The anchor, the anchor of life. You know, um, we are so fortunate to be able to have that anchor that can kind of get us through the tempests of life, as that song says. It stabilizes us it's in this crazy world that we live in. That at any given time, if we would trust in the things around us, uh, our, our ships would sail. Our ships would hit the reef. You know, our ships will be overcome by the, the tides and the waves that are going to crash against us all the time. And we have to remember that what's in Psalms, and we read this before last couple of weeks ago, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. We've got to remember the fact that God's always with us. He is our anchor. He's steadfast in our life. And to what Clifton talked about, we've got to, we've got to remain steadfast in him as well, that, that as, as we go forth in this life, that... Uh, we will remain anchored and firm. Ether, 12th chapter of Ether. <clears throat> Both Ether speaking here and Moroni picks up off of Ether a little bit. And they say some things here that I think are relative to this anchor in life that we have today. <clears throat> Ether says here, was a prophet of the Lord, wherefore Ether came forth in the days of Coriantumr and began to prophesy unto the people for he could not be restrained because of the spirit of the Lord, which was in him. That spirit that Clifton talked about. Ether just had it in him, and he had to tell it, and he did. And he wasn't a very popular guy because of that. But he was making a point, not only for the people in his day, but for us today as well. It goes on to say that he did cry from the morning, even until the going down of the sun, exhorting the people to believe in God, unto repentance, lest they should be destroyed, saying unto them that by faith all things are fulfilled. I'm getting to the point now of this anchor that we have. This anchor is based upon our faith. 
and, and, and how much faith we can have depends, I think, how much we have to endure in our life. You know, and, and you know, uh, Whereas in the Book of Mormon, it says if we didn't have bad things happen to us, we wouldn't know the difference between good or bad. I'm paraphrasing that somewhat. So, so bad things happen to good people for a reason. We'll get into that in a minute. But the fact of the matter is, it's faith that is our anchor, you know, that holds fast. Picks up here in the same chapter, Moroni is captivated by Ether's prophecy here. And he continues on in the rest of this chapter. Actually, let me go back. Ether's not done yet. Ether still says, <clears throat> therefore, whoso believeth in God might with a certainty hope for a better world. And don't we do that? Even a place at the right hand of God. Now, that's where we're headed. Which hope cometh of faith, making an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, kind of like what the hymn says always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God, which is what Clifton talked about in that regard. It's all wrapped together here. Our faith in the Lord, our faith in God, you know, gives us the anchor to be able to withstand the, the trials of life, if you will. And that's where Moroni gets involved. It says that, that as, as Ether continued to prophesy, Moroni says, and now I, Moroni, would speak somewhat concerning these things. I would show unto the world that faith is the things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not because you see not. This is the point where you receive no witness until the trial of your faith, where the anchor has to come in. You know, what he's saying is that, you know, what you're going through in your life it doesn't really mean anything. What it really means is how do you deal with the storms of life? And what he's telling us is that, you know, uh, there's going to be trials in our life. It's inevitable that we're going to have trials in our life. We're going to be tested. You know, I, I think about the testing that goes on in the world today. I mean, you get in an airplane. I remember being up in Seattle, and I was able to have a tour of the Boeing plant up there. Man, this is a huge building. This is like a million square feet building. I don't know. It was just gigantic because they were building these at the time 747 planes so and those things are gigantic so they had a building to fit that in there and so they you know all these engineers spend years kind of designing these planes and trying to figure out how are they going to get this thing up in the air why i mean it's remarkable yes. and they get it to the point where it's all put together and they have this test runway up in seattle there that uh, they, they they test these planes so now they're ready to go but somebody has to fly this thing, a test pilot. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever flown this thing before. They don't know if this is going to go or not. So what do you think that guy is doing? You know, I mean, he's behind that throttle. And I'm sure he has confidence in his own abilities because these test pilots have been through trials and, and tribulations. So they have confidence in their own ability. And they power that clean that goes and that thing just takes off. I mean, you know, in, in uh, I guess their trial of faith is over because the things in, but the fact of the matter is they were tested. Some of us sick people take medicines, right? And those medicines don't happen. There's people in laboratories that, you know, are trying and testing different things to see what works. And lo and behold, they come up with something that, you know, solves your, your heart problem if you have to have nitroglycerin and stuff like that. But that has to be tested. Somebody has to be tested with that stuff as well. You know, and eventually the testing happens and, 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 and they pass and it goes into production and, and we can benefit from somebody else's trial and testing in that regard. You know, what I'm talking about is our faith is going to be tested. Guaranteed, it's going to be tested. Moroni says that you will receive no witness. No witness of what? No witness of the glory and power of God that Clifton talked about. You are not going to receive any witness of his ability to work in your life unless you get tried first. There'll be a trial of our faith, guaranteed. It's not a matter of what, if, it's, it's a matter of when do we get tested and tried. And we've all had our turns at that here. 
and we'll continue to have our turns here as we go along. Hard times come to everybody, and it's not uh, it's it's not just people that don't believe in the Lord. And we can have our own testimonies again, and uh, how much we get tested and tried. Brother Bill, there, nice to see you, Brother Bill. Been ultimate tested. This trial of his faith has been put out there many, many times, but we can hear the testimony of his faith in the Lord that's brought him through. And all of us can have that situation as well. I guess my question is, why, why does God allow trials to happen in our life? Why, why does he let that happen? I, I guess, first and foremost, I think one of his reasons for, for having this occur in our life is the fact that uh, it's, it's to purify our character. It's a it's a molding and a shaping of who we are in our faith that Clifton talked about, that the, in our belief in who God is and who his son Jesus Christ is and the fact that we commit ourselves to them so we can get through our life, that we can have this anchor that holds us steadfast and pure through the times and trials and tribulations that we have in life. I think about just Israel as a group, right? Why did it take 40 years for those people to make it to the promised land because God was turning and turning their faith and trying them left and right, you know, in terms of direction and sustenance of life and, and just the faith alone. And, and he said, you know what, we're going to keep walking until we get the right people that truly believe in me, that have been tried by their faith. And you can see that the glory of God can happen at that time. Abraham, this guy, Pray for a son. For how long? The guy was, what, 90-some years old or something like that. The Lord blesses him a son. And he's happy. His life is just wonderful at that point in time. And the Lord says, well, Abraham, I got a job for you. You got to take that boy that you've waited your whole life for, and you're going to take him to the mountaintop, and you're going to sacrifice him to me. You talk about a trial of faith. Holy smokes. But what does the thing tell us? It does, there's nothing in the scripture about his character tells us that he even hesitated. He was being tried for his faith, I guess. And he got to the point where the knife was above that, that kid to bring it down. And the Lord says, okay, I see what you're made of. You know, you passed the test, you know. And we're all tested. Joseph was tested. Now, he didn't help himself, admittedly, because he boasted and bragged about him being a special kid, you know. Probably didn't help his chance as much with his brothers. But that wasn't the problem. The situation was the plan of God and what had happened. And Joseph had to be tested. And he had to be tried through all the stuff he went through. And each time he was tested at one point in time and his faith got him through, he got tried again. And he had to go through it all over again to the point where by the time he was, you know, leading Egypt, if you will, he had a lot of confidence in God. Even, even in, in that we can see that, 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 that his anchor was holding through the trials and tribulations of life that he had. You know, there was good old Job. That guy did nothing wrong. His, his, his problem was that he was a perfect and upright man. And when Satan said to God, you know, let's 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 test this faith thing, he says, well, no, he's a good guy. He believes. And boy, did he get tried. And did his faith get tested. But because of his faith in God, he was rewarded with, with more than he could ever have before. But the fact of the matter is that he, he had an anchor in the Lord. In, in, in God, he was there, and nothing could shake his faith. So, what are we going through? You know, we're, we're maybe wandering a little bit ourselves, like Israel, and we'd be scratching our head, why am I in this kind of tizzy? Stop for a while, and think about where maybe God wants you to be. Like we talked about last week, where does God want you to be, you know? Where does God want me to be? Where am I? Where am I in that relationship with God? My commitment to Him, and you know, my devotion to Him, my trust in Him, and you know, the fact that He is my anchor through all things that happen in my life. It comes back to an individual decision that we've got to make for ourselves, you know. And 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 we've got the foundation. 
I mean, we, we come here on Sundays and we listen to Sunday schools that give us direction and we listen to messages and more importantly, we listen to testimonies about how I was tried, how you were tried this particular week and something like that. But because of your faith in the belief and the anchor that you've had in God getting you through all the things in your life, you know, it, it, it got you through. Our commitment to God is going to be tried. It's going to happen. He gives us examples here in the Bible and the Book of Mormon. We have examples about ourselves and all that stuff. It's written in Deuteronomy here. It says, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years. He's talking to Israel in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thy heart, whether thou would keep his commandments or no. That's why we get tried. For the exact same reason that he made those Israelites wander for 40 years, it's the same situation here. We just need the awareness of that to understand and not give up and, and, and believe in that anchor that's there with God. You know, the, you know the, the, the other stepping stone to higher ground, I guess, that we have to have is that belief that we have that God can get us through all things. You know, it was once said, you know, there's no promotion without examination. You know, we don't get promoted in our work life uh, just because we existed in our job. We, we get promoted because we've done some, some remarkable things that got recognized because of our, 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 our commitment and our dedication and the effort we put forth in excess. You know, someone said there's no crown without thorns. And I think that there's something to that as well. You know, in the Civil War, <clears throat> they... Uh, they would take these young men that went to the uh, 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 West Point. I think it was called West Point back then too. I don't know, but in military school. And these kids were like 20 some years old. And they went from classes to the front. And you read about these people. They, they became generals at 23, you know, and, and they, they proved their muster by being on the battlefield. You know, they had to dodge the bullets. They had to, they, they, they had to have the strategies to go forth in life. They, they were tested in that particular environment. And, and we're in a battlefield ourselves. And we can all bear witness to the fact that, that if we didn't have that anchor in our life in God and our belief in God, that we would be in dire straits. And we see it all around us. People who don't have that anchor in their life. They're being tried and tested just like we are. But they're not. They're not getting out of it. You know? And we have a way of getting out of it. You know? Isaiah says here. That uh, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire... Thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Gold becomes gold because it gets processed through fire. God's looking at us like, like he looked at Job and said, you know, those people, you know, if they get tried, if they get tested, I have confidence. I hope he's saying that. I hope that we can follow through like Job did. And say, Lord, you know, I can, I can deal with what I have to deal with because my belief is in you and you're going to get me through. And if my mind is right, I can go back to those many, many times where he got me through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I shall fear no evil because thy rod and thy staff. How do we cope? How do we cope? Well, one of the ways we cope would be not to magnify the problem that we face. Greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. So the mountain is there. The challenge is there. It's kind of like, you know, when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and he was so excited to walk to him. And as long as Peter kept his eyes focused on Jesus, he could do that too. And it was when he realized where he was at and what he was doing, 
that he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. Great example for us in our lives today. We're not going to walk on water, but I'll tell you what, we're, we have a situation in our life that we need to stay focused, not on the problem, but on the solution, which is Jesus Christ, our anchor, the faith that we have in God himself. Just remember, too, these trials are temporary. We've gotten through everything that we faced. And 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 in and, and Paul, 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 we talked about Paul a couple of weeks ago and in our, our, our Sunday school lessons as well. This guy, you know, he he had to be tried. When God hit him on that road to Damascus there, that was it. God was saying, I'm done with this guy. We're going to straighten him out. And he gave him an ultimate trial, blinded him for three days, and, and, and he was able to focus on who God was in his life and who Jesus was and, and, and what he represented. And it says here, for Paul says, and he should know this, and we should know too, for our light affliction is but for a moment. It work us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul recognized it. This is a, these, these just trials and tribulations we have, no matter how uncomfortable and no matter how maybe never ending they might be, they do end. If we stay focused on Jesus, don't magnify the problem that's there, but just get closer to him. Put our trust in him. This anchor that holds in God in that situation gets us through. And then we get to the next stage of our life. So don't fix your eyes on the problem. Paul, again, in Hebrews says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us just lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us. And let us run the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set down before him endures the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. So, you know, we, we talked about running the race before us. I think there was one of the scriptures that that uh, Lipton might have talked about. I thought there was something there about running a race. And we are running a race, you know. And, and they were going like crazy, but but as we continue to run this race with, with the goal ahead, that there's more than this life that we can deal with, and we've got to deal with each day as it comes, because as Moroni says, we will receive no witness until after the trial of our faith. We have to keep going on that. So, you know, if you've got an opportunity to read the 12th chapter of Ether, I would do that. Because it kind of puts us back in focus if we can. Moroni goes on to speak in there. You know, we have in the Bible, you know, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, it's it's called the, what is it, the heroes or the faith people in the Bible? Cloud well, witnesses. What? Cloud of witnesses. the cloud of witnesses, that great cloud of witnesses that we're encompassed about. Read it here, because this will tell you that, uh, that Moroni talks about it. Alma and Amulek and, and Nephi and Lehi and, and Ammon and, and all these people, including yeah. the brother Jared, how they had trials of their faith and how they went through it because they focused themselves on the Lord. Trials and tests, we're going to have them. But we have an anchor that, what does it say? We have an anchor. Keeps the soul. Keeps the soul. Keeps the soul. Dead fast and sure as the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. That's at our disposal. We've got that ability. So. Amen. I just wanted to share a few thoughts and sort of put myself in your shoes as uh, we all heard so many scriptures and thoughts this morning from our Sunday school to the message. It's kind of like, you know, when you go into a really big buffet and you know there's more than you can eat. And so you have to pick and choose and say, well, what's the, you know, what am I going to you know, make the most use of here? And I don't even think I need to add more scriptures because we've we've been given a lot to chew on 
one thought that uh, as I heard everything today that, that keeps coming to mind is irony. Um, you know, Walt was saying good people, bad things. And he gave the example of <laughs> Abraham and his son. And, you know, there's no shortage of irony in the scriptures. Serve God and then be tested. Well, why would I want to do that? <laughs> Abraham came to the Lord and he entered into a covenant with him and he finally saw that start to come to pass. And then he's asked to sacrifice it. Um, you know, there was a, a number of other examples too that, uh, uh, that he mentioned in the scriptures. And um, you know, just the idea that we would be tested is um, difficult to understand. But really, these are practice tests, aren't they? Preparing us for that ultimate test at the end. Uh, Clifton mentioned it in his scriptures that there would be a, a storm coming. And will what we build upon stand that storm or withstand, you know, that last uh, uh, testing of this life? And it stuck out to me that in the scriptures from Sunday school, the, the Book of Mormon, the words of uh, King Benjamin, he said that we need to approach the Lord with depths of humility to understand that we are nothing before the Lord. And so I think a lot of our passing of the test is just acknowledging how, uh, how much we need the Lord. You know, last Sunday we sing that song, It Is Well, and one of the lines in it says, I'm helpless. You know, Lord, look upon me in my helpless estate, right? And that's how I feel before the Lord. It's no uh, small irony that the Lord uses people to deliver his message to others. I struggle with that. I struggle with that being ordained. Like, who am I? To represent Christ and speak the words uh, in the scripture and the words of his inspiration to others, and, and it's still a wrestle. Um, Moses dealt with that. You know, he thought, I'm not a speaker. I am not, I don't want to do this. <laughs> and, you know, he gave all these reasons why he was unqualified, and you know what? He was right. He wasn't qualified, and none of us are. And so, as the Lord prepares us by testing, uh, we learn something from it, that there is a reason for it, and that we begin, as, as Clifton always says, to accept that, not to stagger and say, that's too hard, that's unfair, I reject it, but rather to say, okay, I, I see there's a purpose in it, and I will willingly submit myself to it. I will be that cheerful giver that we were encouraged to be today. Because as Clifton said, if we can obtain the glory of God in this life, then we'll have glory in the next. That's the glory to glory. That if we would unite ourselves to the Spirit of God, now, then we'll be united with Him forever. That's the, the test we're preparing for. And so if we want the stability of the anchor that our brother Walt encouraged us to have today, then we need to draw close to the Lord now that we might build, as it said in the Book of Mormon, upon that doctrine that the Lord claimed as his, that we would be able to pass the test and be stable despite the storm. Again, loads of irony that you would think that when I give my life to the Lord, that would be the end of the storms. But no, you know, because I, I don't know, that, that valley of the shadow of death, that doesn't sound like some place I want to go. I'd like to see the bypass and go around it. And that bypass to me would be, you know, very quick and easy. Open the door right in front of you and enter into the realms of glory. Forget the valley. But that's not what the Lord's saying. He's saying, again, so ironically, I'm going to be with you and you're going to go through an adventure. And unfortunately, it might look to you 
in your eyes of flesh to be harrowing at times. But you don't have to worry because my anchor is so much stronger than the trials. And so, you know, Clifton said this in, the, in Sunday school, the verses, and they, they explained that, that the doctrine, as it started introducing the Lord's doctrine, it explained that, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are in perfect unison. And in order for us to obtain the glory, we need to be in unison with that. And so that's the goal. And it gives us the stability to go through everything. It gives us that anchor, that safe place, that refuge to overcome all the things that we face in this life. And so I think it just leaves us in that position of, of, of deep humility, of deep gratitude, of acknowledging our helplessness, acknowledging that by the Spirit of God we can do these things, understand them and carry them out. And there's really no other way. And so, you know, this idea came forth in everything that we heard today, that if we do these things, we shall always, what did it say? Retain in remembrance. We shall always retain our remission of sins. We shall always retain the love of God. That's the anchor. That's the promise. That's the, the method, the way we pass the test. What a beautiful uh, set of thoughts to hopefully strengthen us today. And as I was putting it all together, uh, that's sort of how I processed um, these, these messages. And the Lord gives us um, reassurance and lets us know that although it's unexpected and ironic, this life, it was meant to be. Just hold my hand. I'll walk you through it. So we have a great comfort today. And what does he say? What Clifton mentioned, get baptized. That's the way. And as you do that, and you repent of your sins, and that fire that we talked about changes us, he gives us then by the laying on of hands, the comforter. And that's another word for anchor, if you ask me. We have the comforter to know that as we go through the trials of this life, we are okay. We're going to be okay by faith in our Lord and Savior, our Maker, uh, and doing our best to render obedience to Him. And that's really what we do in this life, isn't it? Processing all this, trying to fit it into place that we might one day come before the Lord and say, I, I tried to serve you. I tried to do my best for you. I tried to walk in your will. And so may God bless us today as we open up our uh, testimony and um, as we think about how to be not sparing sowers. We think about how we can sow plentifully in everything we do and witness for the Lord of his goodness. So may God bless you today. Well, I'll start this morning and praise God and thank him for 